final paper is from Professor Christopher Bean from Penn State University. And Chris is the director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. He has written extensively on um, democracy and general politics in the American context. Um, Chris, are you still with us? I am still with you. Can you hear Excellent. me? Excellent. Okay? Well done. Now, Chris <laughs> is the only one who seems to have a decent time of day to be doing this. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's not uh, late for me. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I'm, I'm going to go with that, huh? Okay. All right. Um, well, I want to, uh, to thank uh, Angela and Michael for, um, for the invitation. <laughs> And um, thank you to uh, Martin and uh, Mariana for uh, really interesting presentations. You're going to hear some echoes, especially from uh, Mariana. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I appreciate that I am the American up on this panel. And uh, that creates a certain amount of pressure. But I'm just going to soldier on and do my best to live up to it. It's, um, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway. Um, I'm trained as an academic, and that means I try very hard not to look past the data and to be a little distant from events so I can maintain the proper perspective. It also means that if I'm honest with myself, I tend to avoid direct declarative sentences. I don't use 10 words when 30 will do. Uh, my inclination is to line up a series of qualifications about what I want to say before I even open my mouth, and to talk only in terms of what is happening rather than what should be happening. And I avoid like the plague, the possibility that my desires might influence my analysis. So when I started writing this, um, I, started, I focused on COVID and how it had really uh, turned over all the normal stuff that happens in a campaign and with voting and, and with things like that and, and how it had impacted the economy and, and how it was changing kind of the, the normal dynamics of an American presidential election. And, but I'm not gonna do that. Because <laughs> then I watched the, uh, the Republican and the Democratic conventions and I watched the aftermath of yet another police shooting of a black American that took place actually during the RNC, the Republican National Convention. And the speeches I saw on both sides and the response of both Biden and Trump to that police shooting and to the protests that followed, all this led me to decide that this is not the time for typical academic distance. Instead, I'm going to try to convey what I think is going on as directly as I can. And what I think is that this is a decisive, even pivotal election. Jonathan Capehart is a columnist for the Washington Post. He's also a black man. And he wrote a column a couple weeks ago during the RNC. And here is his declarative sentence. What's on the ballot is a choice between American democracy and white supremacy. Now, I understand that this is not a statement that an academic normally makes. It is deliberately provocative. It paints with a brush that is way too big. The categories are too all or nothing. I grant all that. But his piece stayed with me. Couldn't get it out of my mind. And as I continued to think about it, I was left with one overriding question. Is he wrong? I don't think he is. I think this election is a choice between American democracy and white supremacy. Trump has never been good for race relations. When he came down that escalator, he talked about Mexicans as murderers and rapists. He talked about closing off all immigration from Muslims. He questioned the citizenship of the first black president. He refused to condemn and frequently retweeted neo-Nazis and white supremacists. His campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, fed into feelings of racial resentment that many white people have. The unstated implication of that motto 
is that other races and ethnic groups do not manifest genuine American values and that they have tried to vault to the head of the line. In the words of New York, column, New York Times columnist Ross Dothat, make America great again conveys the desire to quote, protect a once dominant majority to restore its privileges and reverse its sense of cultural decline. So as much as these, as these reminders make clear, Donald Trump's 2016 campaign was as much as anything grounded in an appeal to white racial resentment. Let me, um, let me give you one more data point to support that argument. Much has been made about the fact that white, while whites with a college degree supported Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump by 30 points, among those white Americans without a college degree, Trump beat Clinton by 40 points. So that's an enormous disparity, right? Distinctive in American politics. And it would appear to demand an explanation. But according to Alan Abramowitz of Emory University, the difference is less important than it seems. In fact, if you select out for racial resentment, if you isolate that variable, there is no meaningful difference between those Trump supporters who went to college and those who did not. The amount of racial resentment is equally predictive for both groups. To quote Abramowitz, white voters with high levels of racial ethnic resentment voted overwhelmingly for Trump regardless of education. And white voters with low levels of racial ethnic resentment voted overwhelmingly for Clinton irrespective of education, unquote. This means the only way to account for the difference between these two groups, this dramatic difference between those with degrees and those without degrees, is the fact that there are a lot more white people who did not go to college who feel racial resentment. So that was a 2016 campaign. As president, Trump went through his desired ban on Muslim immigration, and on the third try, the ban was able to pass constitutional muster. He also touted his wall to keep out illegal immigrants, and when they came across the border anyway, he separated children from their parents and put them in cages. He also claimed there were very fine people among the Nazis in Charlottesville, and he referenced four women of color who were newly elected members of Congress and said that they should go back to their countries. These are just examples. I could go on and on. As for American democracy, the story is much the same. Again, from the time he took the escalator to announce his candidacy, Trump has spurned and even mocked democratic norms. During the campaign and after, he repeatedly come, comes up with schoolyard nicknames for his opponents. After the election, he disputed the popular vote total, claiming without evidence, massive voter fraud. He sees the constitutional system of checks and balances as inconveniences. He said the constitution's second article gives him the power to do whatever he wants. He cozies up to dictators and lies like other people breathe. As of July of this year, over 20,000 documented false and misleading statements. All of these behaviors undermine the norms that are necessary for democracy to function. But here again, one could go on and on. So all of that was before the 2020 RNC convention. After watching all of that, it is patently clear that both of those efforts are going to continue. In fact, the 2020 Trump campaign has doubled down on both objectives, undermining democracy and fostering white resentment. Of course, it is true that the RNC convention worked hard to inoculate Trump against the charge of racism. Some of the best speeches that were given at the, at the convention were in, this, were in service of this agenda. Black U.S. Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican senator, uh, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and former football star Herschel Walker, uh, all of them gave speeches. All of them are people of color. 
all of them sought to demonstrate that Donald Trump is not a racist and that the United States is not a racist country, and likely most importantly, that the people who like Donald Trump, who want to vote for Donald Trump, they are not racists either. You could also make the argument that what went on at the convention was motivated, driven mostly by, by a desire to distract attention from the United States' miserable failure with respect to COVID and the dismal condition of, American, of the American economy. But even if you grant all that, it does not account for, let alone justify, the celebration of racial division that was at the core of the event. The McCloskeys are a white couple from, South, uh, from St. Louis who brandished weapons, uh, an assault rifle and a, and a pistol, at protesters marching past their mansion this summer. This couple was invited to speak at the RNC. They said that Democrats, quote, want to abolish the suburbs altogether by ending single family zone housing, how, how, sorry, by ending single family home zoning. Doing so, they said, quote, would bring crime, lawlessness, and low quality apartments into thriving suburban native neighborhoods your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats America. Donald Trump Jr. framed the election as a choice between quote, church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. Representative Matt Goetz from Florida, one of the president's staunchest defenders in Congress, said Democrats want to quote, disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home, and invite MS-13 to live next door. MS-13 is a Salvadoran uh, gang infamous for, for violence. And this from the president himself. Your vote will decide whether we protect law-abiding citizens or whether we give free reign to violent anarchists, agitators, and criminals who threaten our citizens. Uh, Mariana re referenced this in terms of safety versus terror, scare tactics. It's, it's, uh, you've heard this part before. But is there really any doubt who these people were talking to or who they were talking about. As I mentioned, even while the RNC was going on, another black man was shot by police. This time it was in Wisconsin, my home state. Donald Trump and Joe Biden both traveled to Kenosha where the attack happened. Biden acknowledged racial disparities in healthcare, education, and the criminal justice system. And he said, quote, we're finally now getting to the point of addressing the original sin, slavery, and all the vestiges of it. When Trump came to Kenosha, he did not meet with the family, more he denied the existence of systematic racism, and he focused on businesses burned in the protests that took place following the shooting. At one of those protests, Three people were shot and two of them were killed, allegedly by a white 17 year old Trump supporter. Of this person, Trump had nothing bad to say about him. In fact, he defended his actions saying, quote, I guess it looks like he fell and then they very violently attacked him. He would have been, probably would have been killed, unquote. As for those protesting the police shooting, Trump rejects the very word. They are not protesters, he said. Those are anarchists, they're rioters, they're looters. And on several occasions, in fact, several times in one speech, he called the people who protest thugs. As a point of reference, a report by the US Crisis Monitor concluded that there were over 10,000 protests this summer and that more than 93% of them were peaceful. As for democracy, since the conventions, Trump and his acolytes in the media have all sown doubt about the legitimacy of the election process. He has repeated, repeatedly asserted, again without evidence, that mail-in voting will lead to unparalleled voter fraud. In fact, he said that if he loses the election, that will be the reason, fraud. A week ago in North Carolina, Trump said that his supporters should try to vote both by mail and by person. And he repeated the claim the next day. That, by the way, is a felony. 
and it is also a, a felony to encourage someone else to do so. If an election is seen as illegitimate, then the peaceful transfer of power becomes impossible. And when that, fa when that happens, democracy fails. Trump is quite obviously setting the table for just such a claim should he lose. And he is apparently willing to risk American doc democracy in the bargain. So after all this, I must conclude that Capehart is not wrong. This election is indeed a choice between white supremacy and democracy. And if, after four years of this behavior, and if after a campaign that seeks to celebrate it, if after all that, enough Americans in enough states vote to reelect him, then it will be because a majority of Americans, and let's face it, a majority of white Americans reject the claims that black Americans are making and reject the need to do anything about them and ultimately reject the equality which they demand and upon which democracy must rest. Instead, by their very denial, those Americans demonstrate their desire to restore the status quo ante of a white cultural establishment a society where whites held virtually all the power and other races were tolerated rather than treated as equals. That kind of society is not, and for that matter was not, a democracy. Larry Diamond of Stanford asks his students on the first day of class, when did the US become a democracy? Now these are, Stanford students, they're really smart. He gets lots of different answers. Signing of the Declaration of Independence, passage of the Constitution, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, passage of the 13th Amendment. Diamond says the answer is 1965. What happened then? Passage of the Voting Rights Act. That was when the US officially recognized and legalized the equal standing of all Americans. If Trump is elected, then that recognition recedes, and with it, equality, justice, and democracy. One more cheery point. If you are a Trump follower and you believe everything he says, what are you going to do if Trump loses? Are you going to accept the results and just patiently wait for the next election? I doubt that. I think we're in for an ugly time no matter what happens. And even if democracy wins, that is, even if Biden wins, there is no guarantee that we will see a peaceful transfer of power. So even if that comparatively positive outcome were to transpire, American democracy would still be very much at risk. Of course, as an academic, I have to keep in mind that I could be overstating things, and maybe I am. I do think that another columnist from the Post, E.J. Dion, is right. The American Democratic antibodies have kicked in, and may be, may be enough to preserve us. But there is also the genuine possibility that with this coming election, democracy in the U.S. will end. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, there was never a democracy yet that has not committed suicide. As for me, my opinion follows something that my nephew told me. He said, this election isn't a championship game, it's an elimination game. I, see, I assume you have these in Scotland and you know what I'm talking about. It means you win the game so that you can play another game. If you lose, you go home. So that is to say, if Biden wins, we will not have saved democracy, but we have only saved it for the opportunity to play another game and to continue the fight. That is why I see this as a pivotal election. Democracy and its essential concomitant racial equality, these are hanging in the balance, and I think these are things worth fighting. Thank you very much.